The 80s was a standout period where he dominated Australia. That's it this time. He's made sure he's dating five wickets. He grabs a stump. Long time since we've done that. I think the 80s was something ultimate. It was dramatic. It was awesome. It was a great time. But you'll never, you'll never experience that again. The country was in turmoil, if you remember. And the people needed a lift. He's gone. My mother thought Bobby Willis was on drugs. You could feel the pressure going off us on to them. Here we go again, buddy, both of us. Basically drawing the line and saying, right, that's it, no more. He actually transformed Australian cricket overnight, virtually. We bowled OK and they got out. And that is it. Everything we touched turned to gold. An Ashes victory is Nirvana. You treasure that forever. Has there ever been an Ashes series that has had such an impact as the one in the summer of 1981? It was the 51st time that England and Australia had met to contest the Ashes, and for England, it would produce one of her greatest sporting legends. And for Australia, the ultimate bogeyman. Even now, nearly 40 years on, the series is simply known as Botham's Ashes. Ball. Ian Terence Botham had first burst onto the international cricketing scene as a flamboyant 21-year-old back in the Ashes of 1977. With that sort of start, there was no look. But with back-to-back -back series against the West Indies, it was always going to be a tough assignment. Unsurprisingly, both series ended in defeat, and when England then lost the opening test of the 81 Ashes, it was clear that having Ian as captain wasn't working. Nothing will go right for that man. I felt that he was a, such a free spirit the way he played his cricket that I think the burdens of captaincy, um, you know, really did shackle him. He didn't much care for the uh, organisational participation for that matter in practice. It was anathema to him, really, to tell people to do things that he wouldn't want to do when they were preparing for matches. I think one of the jobs as a captain is understanding all your players. And I found that quite difficult because I didn't understand that players needed motivation to play for their country. You've got to be kidding me. You, know, you want to be out there. And also, I could see it affecting everyone around me, family, and it was obviously affecting me. I was getting grumpy because of frustration more than anything. Things came to a head during the second test at Lord's. It was rain-affected and ended as a draw, but not before Botham had recorded a pair. I'm afraid that's just not good enough. And walked back into the pavilion to almost complete silence from the members. Everybody in the pavilion was looking at their newspapers or at the floor or looking to see if there's any seagulls going over. Stony silence in the long room, so I just gave a few of them the, the eyeball and walked on through. Went up to the room and I thought, this is ridiculous. You know, how am I meant to play cricket like this? Stood in front of the boys in the dressing room, said, lads, I'm giving this away. Said, I can't operate under these circumstances. With England one down with four to play, the selectors had to quickly find a new captain and they opted to reappoint Mike Brearley. It was a decision that at the time didn't ring any alarm bells in the Australian dressing room. We thought, how does he get a game? Because he can't bat and he can't bowl, he can't field. He must be a genius. But when you think about it, Mike Brearley had four strong personalities, or different personalities. He had both the party animal, both on and off the field. David Gow would be that comatosed or laid back. World War Three could be going on, and you'd never know. You had Derek Randall, and he was on planet Mars. And you had Jeff Boycott, that was giving himself love kisses in the mirror. He'd rather him get runs and the team lose. But what Mike was able to do, and we didn't realise it then, he was able to get those four strong personalities just to blend a little bit, to, to you know, fit in with the team. That was his gift. 
His man management was second to none. You know, everybody was very upbeat about him coming back. I remember Breers coming up to me at uh, the Nets in Headingley and saying, do you want to play? I looked at him and I said, of course I want to play, it's Australia. He said, good, I think you'll get uh, 100 runs and 10 wickets. Well, he wasn't too far off. Well, what happened here at Headingley in Leeds between July the 16th and the 21st, 1981, is quite simply the stuff of legend. And in many ways, it set the tone for a decade of Ashes cricket. To start with, everything seemed to be going Australia's way. They won the toss and batted, and thanks to John Dyson's maiden Test 100, declared on 401 for nine. It meant a lot to me to, to actually get a Test match 100. It was a great place, Leeds, at that point. <laughs> it, was, it went downhill from there. When England batted, they were soon in trouble, bundled out for 174 in just 50 overs. And Kim Hughes, Australia's captain, took the fateful step of enforcing the follow-on. So we'd finished the third day, but we had a rest day the next day. Well, I thought, hang on, we've just wrist them for 170. The boys will be pretty fired up on a wicket that's still doing a fair bit. And their, their confidence was very low. With that sort of lead, you weren't thinking about having to score 120 you know, on the last day to win the game. You just thought, oh, we, we'll knock England over again. The momentum was with us. And I knew if we'd won that game, England might have dropped either of Gower or both, or both of them. In the England dressing room, there was already an air of resignation and acceptance at what seemed inevitable. Oh, yeah, I mean, the match was all over to uh, all intents and purposes. We went back to uh, Epworth on the weekend. We had a traditional party at my house on a barbecue on the Saturday night. The Aussies turned up as well on the team bus. Went back to the hotel on the Sunday night and checked out on the morning of the 4th, because we thought we were, you know, on the 4th night, yeah, I did check out. Now I'm gonna pack my things and go. To start with, nothing happened to suggest that Australia wouldn't wrap up a routine win which would put them 2-0 up in the series. Certainly, that was the way the bookies saw it at lunch on day four, with England 78 for four, and still 149 runs adrift. We're in the dressing room day four. England just shot ducks, uh, put the champagne on ice, boys, and that's when the 500 to one flashed up on the scoreboard. 500 to one in a two horse race? You'd have to have a quid on that, wouldn't you? And that was the sort of talk in the dressing room. We're going to win this game. Oh, you'd have to back the opposition, though, because you know, anything can happen. Yeah, you know, Dara just initially was going to have 50 quid on it. And we are sort of, oh, you can't do that. You can't bet against your own team. You know, all these sort of conversations were going on, uh, but all in a very joking sort of manner. He got the bus driver, the geezer, I can't remember his name now, but the geezer was his nickname. He was a Londoner. Dennis gave him 10 to put the 10 quid on. And I was walking out with Rod, and he could see the geezer going around there, and he whistled to him, hey, geez, put five on for me. By just after three on the Monday afternoon, England had lost two more wickets. They were now 135 for seven, still 92 behind. And Botham was joined at the crease by Graham Dilley. I just said to pick her up, just enjoy it. Just go out there and play your shots and we'll see what happens. The both innings started with everyone watching just to enjoy the spectacle of Ian throwing the bat a bit. Beefy just flicked the switch. Every ball seemed to go to the boundary. Lovely shot. And if he didn't get it in the middle, it was almost like one of these modern day bats that got the edge, it was still flying. And that'll be four more. You thought he was going to get out every ball. He nicked him over third man, he slogged him over cover, he smashed some. The ball seemed to go through the stumps, around the stumps, over the stumps, just couldn't get him out. He's really having a lovely time and serve the crowd. I was standing in the field thinking, my goodness, this shouldn't be happening. Thoroughbred At the start, people weren't even watching particularly closely. By the time he'd finished, everyone was watching. It was dramatic. It was awesome. It's going straight into the confectionery stall and out again. Safely away for four. That's a splendid 100. A great innings by Ian Botham. 
and a marvellous tribute as well from his teammates. Hughes's captaincy beggared belief, really. I mean, it was so obvious to everybody else that if he'd brought Ray Bright on and uh, tossed up some lobs, Ian would have hit one up in the air sooner rather than later. Here in hindsight, you'd think maybe I should have done this, but I just had faith in my quicker bowlers. It's just those little little half percenters that could have gone our way, but uh, and the game would have been over on day four. But uh, as it turns out, uh, we're going to day five, and incredible. Well, the entertainment finally came to a close early on day five, when Willis was out, leaving both them high and dry on 149. But crucially, Australia needed 130 to win. I don't think there's any thought of this is going to be difficult, especially given that they just put on, you know, 150 for the, the second last wicket. I still think we were confident, but you could sense a, a change of momentum. You start getting those, the negative conversations come in rather than, oh, you know, 130 will do that, you know, in a doddle. At 57 for one, there seemed only one winner. But then came the second superhuman performance of the match. This one, courtesy of Bob Willis. It really was a difficult delivery. He's gone. My mother always thought Bobby Willis was on drugs, but there obviously wasn't. Bob was focused. I mean, seriously focused. Bob then bowled like a man possessed. Oh, what a good catch. He couldn't talk to me, just ran in, bowled the ball, and if we got a wicket, it was there, and then he wanted to get back to his mark as quick as there wasn't any high five. And I didn't want any distraction from the fielders or celebrating wickets. I just wanted to concentrate on what I was doing. He just found the optimal length where the odd ball was, it was just really flying through. All good catch. Super catch that. Just sitting out in the change rooms, you could feel that sickness in your guts. It was just amazing how the game just turns. In the air, Dilly is underneath it. And he's got it! And you could feel the pressure going off us onto them. Yes, he's got a touch and he's on. Willis has taken his sixth wicket. With Australia 75 for eight and still 55 away from victory, England were now clear favourites only for the match to take another twist. Lilly and Bright counter-attacked and in four overs plundered 35 runs. Just in the nick of time, though, Gatting took a tumbling catch at mid-on. And one run later, it was all over. Bowl him, and it is one of the most fantastic victories ever known in Test cricket history. I remember that moment, Goose just going absolutely mad. Eight wickets, a fabulous performance. I just remember running. England have won this match after one of the most astonishing fightbacks you could ever see. And you end up in the dressing room going, wow, how did that happen? There's other games where it was tighter finishes, but the game had ebbed and flowed a bit more. This one was dominate, 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 then within a couple of hours of cricket, we've lost this game. I don't think there was other games quite like it. They say that lightning never strikes twice, but try telling that to the 81 Australians, because 12 days after Leeds, it happened again here in Birmingham. This time, they were chasing 151 to win. They got to 105 for four, 46 away from victory. But then, once again, the wheels came off, as Ian Botham produced arguably the most memorable spell of his career. Although, to start with, he didn't actually want to bowl. Rears came up to me and said, I think you ought to have a bowl. And I said, well, look, let's just have a couple more overs of spin, and if we can get a breakthrough here, then, yeah, I'll go and get the boots on. I'll be only too pleased to bowl. He agreed with me, said, OK, we'll try two more overs. And then Embers picked up AB. And that's well bowled. Out of a bit of rough stuff there. The border is gone for 40. That's 105 for five. With one end open, Botham quickly changed into his bowling boots, and with Brearley's instructions of keep it tight for Embry ringing in his ears, he embarked upon a spell that would see him in 28 balls take five wickets for just one run and put England ahead in the series. The atmosphere was unbelievable. Stony silence as I started the run-up and then the crescendo of volume as you get nearer to the crease. It was a noise and a half, and it definitely intimidated the Australians. <laughs> Hold him. 114 for six. And the 
crowd has gone noisily berserk. As the game got a little bit thrilling on the last day, I actually went for a run. I couldn't watch it. So I went running in the nearby park and I could hear the wickets falling. In my entire time as a test player, that was the one time I think when I had it in my hand, it was an older ball, but I actually felt I could do what I wanted with it. And there's Goldie, a joyous triumphant both of them. He's out, LBW. This is incredible. That's it this time. He's made sure he's taken five wickets. He grabs a stump. And another memorable victory for England. Tremendous scenes here at Edgebuster. Just after what happened at Headingley, and then to witness it all again, and, and both of them again, the heroics, yeah, it was just incredible. The, the noise factor is a factor, because England come into the game, and you're not playing against 11 guys, you're playing against, you know, 30,000. It's, it's quite incredible. And, of course, Botham wasn't finished with Australia yet. The two sides now travel to Old Trafford, with England 2-1 up with two to play. But their batting was still far from stable, and once again, they stuttered in their first innings to 137 for eight before they were rescued by new boy Paul Allett. All I remember about that innings is getting a little bit of gentle abuse from Rodney Marsh, playing two, three, maybe even four Chinese cuts off Perry Alderman missing the stumps on the way, frustrating the Australians beyond all measure. Oh, he's done it again. Would you believe it? Paul Hallett has made 50 in his first test match, and the crowd rise to salute a new hero of Old Trafford. Hallett ended 52 not out, as England recovered to 231, and he was then subjected to a dose of really man-management brilliance. Obviously, I was in a state of euphoria. So I'm taking my pads off and Breers comes over to me and he says, Paul, wonderful, great effort, brilliant performance. I'd just like you to do one more thing now. I'd like you to take the new ball with Bob. Well, it, it proved to be inspirational, a masterstroke, because I didn't have time to be nervous, did I? I bowled three overs, got a wicket in my third over, and um, he took me off then, straight away. Beefy came on and I think he got two wickets in his first over. What a catch! David Gower, and the whole thing is in tatters. Maybe after their collapses at Leeds and Birmingham, it was hardly a surprise when Hughes's men were bundled out for 130 in their first innings. In boxing terms, they were out on their feet, and it was left to both them, with the second innings 100, to deliver the knockout blow. Unlike Headingley, where there was an element of luck, quite a lot of luck, at Old Trafford, it was much more precise. <laughs> They just mustn't give this fellow room to play outside the off stump. Down the wicket, big hit, glorious shot, all the way. This was a superb innings. His treatment of the Australian pace attack was incredible. Good shot. I can remember Dennis, you know, trying to bump him out. And, of course, Ian just dispatching it into the crowd. But he played some phenomenally good shots. That was just about the best shot both of played today was just dominant and he just fed off what happened at Headingley and then what had happened at Edgebaston. He was back. What a superlative exhibition this has been. And the whole of Old Trafford rising to its feet. Set over 500 to win and to keep the Ashes alive, Australia did restore some pride in their second innings with Yallop and Border both getting hundreds. But England won the game. Yes, he's out and thus the Ashes. Willis taking the final wicket and Mike Rayleigh's triumph completed. Even at the time, I felt that it was, you know, too little too late. Yeah, made 100, but I'd swap it for 40 at Leeds. Eventually, when we uh, beat them, a very elevating moment. And you can imagine from the depths of despair in the West Indies when Kenny Barrington died, to the defeat at Trent Bridge, Ian's resignation stroke, sacking at Lords. Shows how quickly things can turn around in sport. So what impact did those 33 days between July the 16th and August the 17th, 1981, when the series was won, have on cricket and the country? Well, to put it quite simply, it changed everything for everyone. This time. The country was in turmoil, if you remember. You had the race riots, there was all kinds going on, and the country needed a lift. And this came along, 
and it changed my life overnight. It made his career both as a cricketer on the field and as a commercial entity off it. And for cricket as a whole, the fact that it got everyone together from all sorts of different sectors of the great British community, I think it was mighty important for cricket as well. I wasn't prepared for what was round the corner. I used to be able to walk down the road and nip into the butchers when I was in Taunton and go back and barbecue a steak or whatever. And, but now suddenly everyone was wanted a piece of you. It was hard and something that we weren't trained for. We had nobody. You felt very much left to your own devices. Kath would go down the street and if there'd been some gossip in one of the papers, you know, she felt the eyes were... Uh, yeah. So it, it was a difficult time. It wasn't just Ian's cricketing career, it was our marriage, our personal life together. I look back now and somebody had said to me a few years before all this had happened, this is what's going to happen to you. So, oh, no way, I don't, I, no. I just wish I knew it was coming and then I could have prepared and the family could have prepared. But you know, at the end of the day, Charles, I wouldn't swap it. It was a great time. We're being physically attacked here. We need to respond. How you can make a decision like that is totally beyond me. I said to oh, Abby, have a go at these idiots. I get our first ball here. I thought we've got them here. England win by three runs. That's the closest test match I've ever played in.